Well, I guess the uh, the next gentleman on the show really doesn't need an introduction, being um, from the band, of course, that you just heard. The band being Twisted Sister, and welcome to Rock Pose Roulette, Mr. J.J. French. Well, thank you so much, and uh, thanks for that wonderful non-introduction. <laughs> much appreciated. Well, obviously, we're, uh, we're going to talk about the fantastic new DVD, Twisted Sister, We Are Twisted Fucking Sister which uh, one of my reviewers uh, very kindly reviewed for the website. It is two and a quarter hours of um, absolute pure entertainment and history. Um, I absolutely enjoyed every minute of it. Well, thank you. We tried to make it as long as possible to give you guys a feeling <laughs> of what the frustration was like for 10 years. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's, it's just, I mean, people probably don't realise, I guess, a lot of them, that the absolute history behind the band and how long uh, they've been going. It's, uh, what's great, actually, is looking at the early stuff, and uh, I was amazed how much footage you've still got of those early days. Um, I'm sorry, you cut, you cut out a little bit. Are you on a cell phone yourself? No, I'm on Skype. Are oh, you on Skype? Okay. Uh, could you repeat that question? Yeah, of course. One more time? Well, of course, some people won't realise how long the band's been about, but it's great to see those early days, and it's uh, amazing to see how much footage you've still got from those days. Well, you know what's interesting is that when we got to England in 1983, and we became friends with uh, the Gary Bushels and, uh, and um, Ross Halfins and um, Malcolm Domes and Dante Panuto, I don't know if you're familiar with yeah, some of these names or all of them, from Kerrang! They actually kind of really understood the band. They got the band. They wanted to know about the history of the band. And they fell in love with the band because they felt the band was authentic. Uh, these were all things that somehow our American journalists and record labels completely disregarded. Um, and, and you guys got it. And we were kind of accepted as a, as a great live act, whereas here we had been around for so long that people thought we weren't real and they didn't pay attention to us. So... Um, the story of how the band got to where it got is what makes the, the uh, documentary so fascinating. It's such a different story than any other band. Um, it has nothing to do with we're not going to take it, nothing to do with I want to rock, and everything to do about the struggle to succeed, and that's what makes it so special because it's not just rock music. It, it can be applied to almost any business or any personal situation for that matter. Well, when you're talking about a band paying their dues, I mean, you guys paid it in tenfold. Well, yeah, our, our joke was we were turned down more times on the bed sheet in the whorehouse. <laughs> and, and uh, you know, by the time we got to England, we were already, you know, nine years in the making and, and already had about, I had personally about 7,000 performances in at that point Whew. or close to eight. I mean, we're, we're over 9,000 performances mm. at this point. So uh, the legacy, of course, is the live show, but uh, it was the determination of the band. Because if you look at the history of most great bands, of Beatles, Stones, Who, Zep, Floyd, Queen, just to fill in the blank with any band you want, they basically were all signed within six months of getting together, except for the Beatles who spent two years playing in Germany. I don't know if any one of those bands would have lasted 10 years, frankly, to get a record deal. No, I think you're absolutely right. I mean, it, it just tells a testament that, that that faith you had in going forward with the band. Um, I'm guess what you're saying about the fact that when you came over to Britain, the fact that um, a lot of the journalists um, understood the band. I guess it, the UK's got quite a history of that. I mean, you've only got to look look at sort of the likes of Jimi Hendrix uh, coming over here and us getting him straight away, where, of course, in the States he wasn't uh, initially popular. Well, you're correct. Jimi Hendrix was, was uh, playing in a bar on um, McDougal Street in the village with a band called Jimmy James and the Blue Flames. And they were playing matinee shows to anybody that would walk in, right? And so Chaz Chandler comes in, uh, sees him and freaks out. And there's Jimmy playing every Saturday afternoon. I mean, this is Jimmy freaking Hendrix, right? Yeah. And yet it took England to recognize it. You know, you also did it with the Stray Cats as well. Stray Cats were from Long Island. Mm. They played little bars in Long Island. They came over to England, played the marquee. People went crazy. Sometimes you need that. And by the way, it works in reverse. I think if you were to ask Led Zeppelin back in the early days, if they got support in England, they'd tell you absolutely not. They had to come to the United States. I think they would tell you that. It's weird, isn't it? I mean, how, it, how these things work out. I mean, it's, I'm guessing 
if we talk about the music scene now, I mean, I ask a lot of people from the States um, the health of sort of the live scene, and they say it's an awful lot of sort of tribute bands, etc. How do you find the scene out there at the moment? Um, it's, it's hard for rock and roll. Um, rock is, is a dying art form, and the replenishment of the rock stock is not happening. It's kind of like if you look at a fishery and you, were, you know, where's the young fish coming up? You know, there's plenty of young hip-hop stars and young rap stars and young female pop stars and, and young country stars. But if you think about this, this is when people tell me, oh, rock's not dead, I, I, I give them an example. And I go, really? Then explain this to me. When I was 17 years old, um, Jimi Hendrix, the Rolling Stones, the Beatles, Floyd, Zeppelin, Grateful Dead, Janis Joplin, Jimi Hendrix, Bob Dylan, None of them were older than 26 when I was 17, okay? Think about this for a minute. Think about the uh, unbelievable amount of phenomenal 26-year-old mm. musical geniuses are out there, okay? Now, name me 26-year-old rock geniuses. Can you name them? Well, you're going to struggle to come up with as many as you've just named, that's for certain. You're going to come up with almost none. Rock doesn't sell anymore. Uh, the... the Amplifiers and guitars, um, uh, the market worldwide is down. It has nothing to do with whether you want to believe me or not. I mean, it just happens to be the truth. You walk into music stores, you, you, go to the, you go to the trade shows. So the dream of being that guy that stands in front of a mirror and wants to be a rock star uh, is not the dream. Maybe they want to be DJs and play EDM festivals and get paid a quarter of a million bucks for turning a record. I mean, maybe they do. But the idea of rock and roll as a healthy medium right now isn't, isn't particularly healthy. There's people out there doing it. But I also explained to bands when I was starting out, you know, just to date me a little bit, gasoline was 19 cents a gallon, hotel rooms were $19 a night, truck rental was 25 bucks a week, house rental was $300 a month, the drinking age was 18, so there was thousands and thousands of bars with hundreds of thousands of kids going out to see them, and there was a huge record industry that you could kind of, you know, make your money playing, playing in cover bands, learn your craft. It was a very simple pathway. Got your band together practice, learn some songs, play in a bar a year or so, maybe get your songs together and make demo tapes. Now, gas is, you know, 4 5 $6 a gallon. Hotel rooms are $200, $300 a night. Truck rentals $500 a week. House rentals $3,000 a month. Um, the drinking age is 21. The amount of clubs that exist is 10% of what they used to exist, and there's no record business. So you add up all that, you got a problem, yeah. a big one. I think um, we're probably... A little bit, and I say little, uh, meaning little, a little bit luckier in Europe um, because there are new bands around, certainly in a sort of the melodic rock style, um, and certainly sort of bl young blues artists coming through. So maybe we're lucky on that point. But as you're saying, it's not what it was. Um, the, the number of venues that are open, uh, are, as you're saying, are, are far fewer than uh, in the, the, the golden years, I suppose we're going to have to start calling it now. Uh, you're absolutely right. And also, those those bars and those clubs, that's where you learn your craft. Mm, that's absolutely. That's how you learn to do what you got to do. And, and there's just so few places to, to do it. And I just find the whole thing kind of... Look, I, I, some people really kind of bemoan it and are upset about it. I am really kind of not. I look at it and go, rock and roll had a 50-year lifespan. You know, it did phenomenally well. It, it gave the soundtrack to hundreds of millions of lives. Yeah. Maybe things move on. Maybe things change into a different dynamic, I, I, and possibly they evolve. Uh, the two guitars, bass, drums, lead singer thing, I just see less and less and less of that. Mm. These days. I guess because of uh, people looking back in a nostalgic way, is probably why, uh, say, TV shows like Vinyl are doing so well, because people want to reminisce about those great times. Well, I think that the marketplace for classic rock bands, us, Priest, Kiss, ACDC, Black Sabbath, uh, Scorpions, Priest, is, White Snake is bigger than it's ever been because we exemplify an era. Yeah. But the problem is there's no younger ones coming up. Even when you talk to young kids who love our music and you go, well, what do you buy from the new ones? They don't support their new bands, which I find kind of really interesting mm. because most of us, to be honest, are 60 years old at this point, all right? And to, and to be honest, when I was 17 years old, if I told my mother I was going to go see a band that was 60-year-old guys, she'd like look at me and go, what, are you crazy? <laughs> yeah. she goes, so she's looking at me and go, what, is the Glenn Miller Orchestra playing somewhere? I mean, are you kidding me? So the fact that we're all 60 
I mean, the Rolling Stones are what ninety? I mean, I don't even know. <laughs> the Stones are so old; they 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 don't their fans don't clap because they're afraid the lights will go on in the arena. I mean, we're, I mean, watching Mick or try, watching Ronnie Wood and and Keith Richards try to play guitar these days it's like driving in a tour bus with Jose Feliciano and, and Ray Charles without a GPS. Those guys, I don't even know how they get around on stage anymore. But they're the last connection to the Beatles, and people are willing to spend a lot of money to get that connection. So they are the recipients of a lot of uh, memories and a lot of nostalgia. And in a way, we, being a member of that next wave with Kiss and Judas Priest and Aerosmith and Scorpions and ACDC and Sabbath, we provide a link to a certain level of, of, of experience in the past. And as you know, because unfortunately we watched Lemmy pass away, mm. and my drummer died last year, of course. and Ronnie Dio has passed away, and you hear story after story after story of this one having cancer, and this one being sick, et cetera, et cetera. What's going to happen in five years with all these festivals that we're all headlining? Where are we, what's going to happen in five years to the Bloodstocks? What's going to happen to, um, to all the big shows when we're all gone? I, I, I mean, who replaces us? Is it Nirvana? Uh, you know, or, or I should say, is it Pearl Jam? Is it Alice in Chains? Who's coming up to replace the big festival bands? I, I don't know the answer to that. I, I, I unfortunately are going to have to agree with you 100%, uh, as sad as it is. Uh, I'm, just, I'm just glad, I guess, because um, being of the generation I am, I had a chance to live through those heady days and got to, got to go to many gigs and clubs when I was a teenager and got to see bands every week, so maybe I'm one of the lucky ones. Uh, I, look, I'm, I'm 63, and I had... The greatest time of my life watching Zeppelin, Open Fire, and Butterfly, and and uh, you know seeing Pink Floyd as an opening band to, to Fleetwood Mac at the Fillmore East. I saw the Who and Cream open for Wilson Pickett. The tickets were three bucks, yeah. and I did it every every weekend. Mm. It was in New York City, you could see these bands every weekend. I'm assuming in London back in the '60s with the Roundhouse and the Marquee, you could go and see ACDC and Yes and Jeff Beck and the Yardbirds and the Rolling Stones. And 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 uh, and all these amazing artists for like five pounds or or whatever it yeah. was back then. So we had an extraordinary experience, extraordinary time. Um, right now, concert tickets are like eight hundred thousand dollars a ticket. Yeah. I don't even know you can afford to go to these things anymore. It's so hard. But I'm grateful, and I think that the reason why our movie's doing so well is because our movie tells the story of a classic band, Twisted Sister, and the struggles that the band has to be successful and to never say never, to never give up to keep pushing no matter what. And I'm very, very proud of the movie, which is why the movie's gotten great reviews and why you and I are on the phone, because you uh, enjoyed the, uh, the story so much. I did. I, I, it, was, it was great, actually, to see that footage of, uh, of uh, Twisty Sister on the tube. I mean, I remember seeing you guys. I remember that being broadcast at the time. And it's, just, it's really, really great to see that again. Well, I appreciate that. Like I'll tell you, Britain has a special place for the band because... That's where the band kind of got its second wind. You know, yeah. uh, the movie tells a story that we had run out of every option in America. And, um, of course, the stories of how we got screwed are, 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 are funny now in comical uh, retrospects. While they were happening, it was devastating. Of course. Okay, it was absolutely devastating. But it makes for a great story now. And, um, and we are forever indebted to our, to our British fans for supporting us. You know, the first place we ever played in England was in Wales actually, opening up for Motorhead um, in uh, June of 82 at the Wrexham Festival. I guess um, it was quite a gamble for you guys to, to make that leap over the pond to, to the UK. Uh, did you have any sort of inkling of how uh, the band was going to be taken by the British artists, uh, uh, sorry, British audience and, uh, uh, and the British sort of press? Well, we did because we kind of knew how the uh, how those guys from Sounds Magazine had placed our singles on their on their personal play playlist. Yeah. So we knew there was an underground. Uh, we knew there was a very authentic underground belief in the band. That's the best way to put it. It wasn't a belief created by a corporation. It was a belief uh, inspired by the journalists who found these independent singles and decided to champion the band. Most people don't even know that there was even serious talk at one point that Paul Conroy, at president of Stiff Records was going to sign us to Stiff because he thought we were a strict punk band. 
So think about how ironic that would have been <laughs> had yeah. we signed to Stiff, you know. And as it was, we signed to Secret Record, which was a punk label yeah, anyway. Of we were on the same label they exploited because they thought our attitude was punk, even if the music was more metal than punk. Um, but it was always authentic, and people believed it because we believed it. And I think British journalists, um, uh, I, maybe it's changed. I certainly don't want to make comments about today because I don't know. But I think in those days, and I think you'd agree with me, that when you read Sounds magazine, you read Kerrang, uh, you believed when those guys believed in something. Am I right in that? I totally agree with you. I mean, um Without sort of hoisting uh, my own flag up, I mean, I'm probably fairly well known amongst my very small group of listeners uh, for someone who speaks his mind and, um, and and has a strong opinion on things. And I only ever play stuff on my show if I like it, which I guess is a bit of a rarity these days. Well, you had a luxury that a lot of people don't have. And, uh, and, and so that, that authentic face is what helped us get credibility. And of course, Lemmy, you can't say, how, how can I leave that out? No. Lemmy fell in love with Twisted Sister, and once Motorhead gave us the approval, that meant bikers could like transvestites. Yay! <laughs> <laughs> well, of course, I mean, Lemmy, Lemmy always had a, a very long um, tradition of supporting and helping bands out. Oh, man. God, he's the godfather of us, you know, uh, over there. So he was so important to the band's career, and, um, and, uh, and it was so sad losing him last year. He, he, been, he, he played on stage with us many, many times. Um, we have a lot of videos of him with us. And it's the last show he did, I can't remember the venue. I think it was in, I think it was a Sweden Rock. And if it wasn't Sweden Rock, it was in Germany. He came on stage doing It's Only Rock and Roll, but I like it. And I looked in his eyes. He wasn't well that day. I, I was scared for him that day. Mm. I was, I, I thought, I didn't even know if he was going to go off the stage. I was that scared. And then... Later on in the day, uh, we, we, we hung out in the dressing room and we called a mutual friend of ours, uh, this woman, Jill Massey, who helped the band out when she was working for Doug Smith, who was the original management company for Motorhead. And he, per he, he perked up and we had a great conversation with Jill. That was the last conversation Jill had with him. And he was great, but I was worried for him on stage, you know. Uh, what a wonderful, what a wonderful, wonderful guy. I only ever got the chance to meet him once, um, which was... Um he used to have a rock night at a hippodrome in London on a Wednesday, and I had a chance to chat to him then. And what um, an unassuming guy he was! It was just um, there was just never any attitude or ego to him, and he was always happy just to, as long as you bought him a drink to have a chat about anything you wanted. No, he was a very authentic guy. Knew history really well. Mm. Sit down with him, have great conversations with him. He was a regular guy. I mean, he really just was a funny, irreverent guy who'd have a conversation with anybody uh i think a lesson dio was like that too i don't know if you ever met ronnie i never but met ronnie, him unfortunately i wish i had ronnie was one of the most selfless sweethearts the total antithesis of the rock star prick if you don't mind me saying so <laughs> you know just wonderful people great people well as you say unfortunately everybody's getting older myself included and it it is a shame to see you know I think we forget, because we've grown up with bands like Twisted Sister, etc., we forget how old we all are. Because, let's face it, in our heads, we're still 19 years old. That's right. And now, most of the British bands we, 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 we play with now, they all look like there's extras from Game of Thrones. <laughs> 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 I mean, everyone looks like they Deep Purple's road match. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that's where we all wind up. Game of Thrones, you know, all our roadies wind up on Game of Thrones. It's kind of like what it looks like. So, uh, yeah, everyone's like 60 or older. It's freaking, it's freaking me out, man. It really is. I, I like to think I'm still 19, but I don't think so. Well, maybe mentally, maybe not physically. I think that's how we'll have to no, put it. No, rock and roll does keep you young. I will <laughs> say that. Well, rock JJ... Young, the, spirit, the, spirit, the spirit of rock and roll keeps you young. Absolutely. Well, JJ, I'll tell you what, it's been an absolute treat and a pleasure and chatting to you, sir. Uh, I say absolutely love the DVD. Guys, if you haven't seen it, I strongly suggest you go out and buy it. Even if you're not a massive Twisted Sister fan, you'll just enjoy it because it's a good, honest tale of the struggles of a band who made it big. Thank you. Even if you hate us, you'll love this movie. I, I think I, I don't know. I generally think you're absolutely right. It's uh, uh, the fact that it's Twisted Sister to a certain degree is irrelevant. It's just the fact it is a great 
documentary and a great story of a struggling band. Thank you so much for your support. And will I see you at Bloodstock? That will depend on lots of things, health reasons amongst others, but we'll keep our fingers crossed and see if we can get there. Well, you know what? You know how to reach me. Text me, let me know, and if you're there, I will look for you, okay? JJ, absolute pleasure, sir. I say um, all the best. I give my regards to the rest of the band. I know D is up to his usual tricks up in, uh, up in Washington, D.C. at the moment, so... Yes, I certainly will. Thank you and all of our fans over in the UK. Thanks so much for your support and help over the years. Take care. You too. Cheers now. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.